Welcome to the Moms of Tweens and Teens podcast. If some days you doubt yourself and you don't know what you're doing, if you've ugly cried alone in your bedroom because you felt like you're failing, well, I just want you to know you're not alone and you have come to the right place. Raising tweens and teens in today's world is not easy, and I'm on a mission to equip you to love well and to raise emotionally healthy, happy tweens and teens that thrive. I believe that moms are heroes, and we have the power to transform our family and to impact future generations. If you are looking for answers, encouragement, and to become more of the mom and the woman that you want to be, welcome. I'm Cheryl Gould, and I am so glad that you're here. The puberty years, they are full of so many changes with our daughters. There's mood swings, greater pressures, technology, up and down emotions, crying one moment and then laughing the next. And they also have that pull for greater independence. The question becomes, how do we have these awkward conversations? What do we say? Well, today, Dr. Cheryl Ziegler is back talking to us about preteen daughters, puberty, and how we can support them through all the changes they go through. Well, welcome, Cheryl. And I'm so happy that you're coming back to share your wisdom and your expertise. Well, thanks for having me back on, Cheryl. I'm really uh, delighted to be here. I know that you have a program that you're doing. So I do want to talk about that. It's for tween girls and their moms. So I do want to touch on that a little bit. But I also just want to start out talking about this pivotal time in our daughter's lives and how it can be tough because they are going through so many changes. There can be mood swings, their hormones are raging. And I know for me, when my daughter, my oldest hit the tween years, I had no idea what was normal and what was not normal. And I needed somebody like you. So first, I just want to, for all the moms that are listening, I want to normalize whatever they're going through. So share with us, what do you see when it comes to moms and their daughters? What are some of those challenges? So one of the things I want to, I want to speak to is what you said in your intro, which is, you know, you had no idea what what was about to happen when your daughter hit her tween years. And I think that there's a couple of things that throw moms off. First and foremost, that we're seeing these, what I think a lot of moms describe as preteen type behaviors, you know, at age 10. And I think they think it's going to be deeper into middle school, closer to 13. Um, You know, the tween years are these transitional years. But for some people, it's like fifth grade comes on and all of a sudden, you know, people are like, there's a teenager in my house. What has happened? And so I think that's what some people are surprised by is this is not something to wait to talk to your daughter about, you know, middle school or challenges or changes or all of these evolving issues, acne, all these things that are happening to them. You don't want to wait till 12 and a half or 13. It actually needs to start, I believe, really in fifth grade. So that's about age 10. And I've had people as young as nine. So it's developmentally, of course, there's a huge range. And that's the confusing thing. I think, you know, think about when we had babies and toddlers and they all give or take a couple weeks here and there, they achieved milestones pretty close to one another. And all of a sudden you get to nine or 10 years old and you've got someone who's five feet tall. You've got someone who's four feet tall. You've got someone who's developing. You have someone who's not. Someone who still plays with dolls and, you know, sleeps with a bunch of stuffed animals. Another one who wants to be a YouTube sensation. So there are a huge variances of what we're seeing. And I think that's what parents are not prepared for. I kind of want to like, just pause on that, that there's a window of opportunity. Yes. When they hit nine, 10, and they're more open. 
and yes. they're willing to talk more about this. And then they hit uh, eighth grade, you know, they enter high school. It's, it's more difficult. I found, I have two daughters and that was more difficult to talk about those things. All of a sudden they become more private where I love that you are focusing on tween daughters because it's before everything. I mean, yes, the hormones hit and the mood swings can hit, but it's really before you're, it's so proactive before they enter into some of those challenges they can have later on. It really is. Like It's interesting. My, I feel like my whole practice really for people who maybe aren't familiar with me is I, I am in Denver and I have a private practice and I have a group practice. So there's you know, seven of us and I've had it for 15 years. And I mostly see girls who are tweens and teens and well now and some young um, adults in college because I stay with them for a long time. But, you know, each stage has their unique challenges. And like you said, their unique opportunities. But I think the gift of understanding the tween years is that you can be a little ahead of it. Like you said, like I, I think 10 year olds still want to talk to mommy. 10-year-olds still want to ask these really innocent questions. They are not yet to the point where they they do. A girl always wants to know, but they won't ask. You know, they're they're they do still want to ask you and they will ask you. And so I think that you need to prepare them as well. I mean, I've had I've done this class that I call Start with the Talk since 2013. So I have truly done it with hundreds and hundreds of moms and daughters. And the moms get as much out of it as the daughters because the moms will say it's the same story. Every time they say, I wish someone would have told me these things. I wish somebody would have prepared me for what was about to happen. I had no idea what was going on. You know, I find out from my best friend's older sister, what to expect. So I think that um, there is this wonderful opportunity to have what, what right now, if you have a nine or 10 year old, aren't too difficult of conversations because maybe they're not happening yet. Maybe they're six months or 12 months off from happening, but you're preparing them. So it goes a lot easier than when you're in the crooks of a crisis. And then all of a sudden, maybe they don't want to talk to you. Yes. And what I love about your program is you are laying the foundation for that relationship. You're laying early on to be able to set up where moms and daughters can talk to each other. Yeah, I will, I will say that probably it you know, comes from a lot of things, just philosophically how I treat the people I work with. But I'd say also it comes from a, almost a wellness model. You know, let's not wait for something to go wrong, for your kid to um, you stumble upon pornography online, for your kid to be rejected by their group of friends and be utterly in the dark about why did that happen, for them to have feelings for somebody else that they don't quite understand. Like, why should we wait for that to happen and the confusion and maybe anger or sadness that can accompany that when we know we can predict fairly well what's about to happen. And if it doesn't happen directly to your child, I assure you it will happen to somebody who they're very directly connected to. And so you want to do this balance of sort of preparing them and filling them in, but doing it in a way that's not scary. It's just like, Hey, this is what's about to happen. And Hey, here's why here's some ideas on how to handle it versus being in it. And then feeling so like, this is so hard to go through together. Wow. And you're the guide. I mean, you guide through this online program, so you don't have to be bumbling through it you know, or yes. just hand them a book. I will say parents say to me what I want most with my, uh, tween are tips on how to communicate. How do I communicate with them? And so I think that it is much easier to communicate when you're kind of like in the know, when you understand what's happening in the dynamics of their friendship group, when you understand what's happening, you know, don't, don't put your head in the sand and think when they go to middle school, there's no exposure to sex and drugs. There are. And so when you're very in the know, it's a lot easier for you to be your child's guide, for you to have the words to talk to them, to bring up the topics versus feeling like, oh my gosh, I had no idea that, you know, in sixth or seventh grade, my daughter would be vaping, you know, things like that, that parents just like, then they are scared. 
and they don't know what it all means. Yeah, you're helping moms to be less reactive and more proactive because yeah. when something like that happens, you're out of that fear place. Then your daughter pulls away. They feel that energy. They feel controlled. And so you are offering like, let's get ahead of it and be more proactive. So you're not living out of that fear and that reactive place. So tell us, how did you get the idea to start the program? You told a little bit about that, but I feel like there's more. Yeah, there is more. I mean, it was it was out of my own awareness. So basically, that's someone brought to my awareness. So basically, I had a friend named Kim who um, moved to San Francisco for six months or so with her two daughters that seemed super young at the time, third and fifth graders. And she came back from San Francisco and we went out to dinner with a group of people and she was telling us about the highlights of the trip. And then she said, um, you know, one of the really cool things I did with my daughter was I went to this class that taught us all about puberty. And I was like, really? Like, what do you mean? What were you, what were you taught? And so she said a nurse had taught it. It was at Stanford and they were teaching. It was, I think a lot based on the physical changes that happened throughout puberty. And so I, she was talking and I was staring at her because I was thinking, I do this every day in my practice, but one-on-one, these one-on-one conversations with girls who, I guess they figure I'm in therapy. You seem like you might know. And they ask me questions, you know, they'll say to me at the time, the girls were saying to me things like, how do I tell my mom that I think I need a bra? Mm -hmm. Um, What should I do? My parents are divorced. And what do I do if I get my period at my dad's house? Um, do I use it? Do I do a tampon or do I do a pad? I mean, they just, all these questions. And of course the friendship questions. So she's telling me about this course and how impactful it was for her and her daughter. And my wheels just got turning. And so actually the first year she helped me launch it. And I just said, let's just see what happens. I don't know what's going to happen, but I do this. I can do this. So I created my own curriculum that probably, you know, because of the different disciplines was is it's a third about the physical changes, but two thirds of it are about the social changes and the emotional changes. And I just put together a curriculum that I created. I read every book I could possibly read on the topic. And there's not that many of them, but there's enough of them. And I just did it. And it just truly has taken off from there because there's always, there's always tears. There's always hugs. There's a lot of gratitude. The girls, I, I create little, their period pouch for them. And one of the really cute things is I put a lollipop in there and I say, <laughs> and, and again, honestly, this is probably more Kim's idea. She's got all these great mom ideas, but I put a lollipop in there and there's just like a little note that was like, that's like, you know, when the day finally comes, wherever you are, um, whether there's tears in your eyes or a smile on your face, you know, just suck this lollipop and, and remember this moment. And I've had these beautiful cards and letters and emails sent to me of girls who are like, I was crying in the bathroom. I sucked my lollipop. <laughs> it's so cute. So it's just sort of like a, almost like this, you know, transitional object for them. So I would recommend whether you do the class or not, moms that are listening, that um, on that aspect of it, the physical changes that you leave them little notes that just say things like, you're so beautiful. I love watching you develop. And I will tell you that the one really lovely thing that comes out of the class is I, to me, it's all about celebrations. It's about welcome to young womanhood. You are a young woman now. I think that's also what you were saying, Cheryl, instead of being reactive and like, oh my God, the time is here. You know, she wants a boyfriend, she wants a bra, she has her period, whatever it is. Instead, it's like, we have been prepared for this for a year or two. I welcome you. I celebrate you. I love you. You've blossomed. And there is a real difference on how that's received. So I make everybody sign something that says, I give them a few minutes and they talk about what they're going to do the day that it comes the day that it comes, um, that they become a woman. And what are they going to do to celebrate? Most people will say, we're going to go out to a lunch, just you and I. And it just, it's very emotional because I think that so many women our age say, nobody was celebrating with me. I didn't know this was a beautiful rite of passage. I just thought it was something terrible that happened to you and you had to figure out how to manage. So that's how the class was inspired and, and how it's come to be today. It's an online class because of the pandemic. 
And I thought I, in 2020, I can't not teach this class. I can't not do this. Like I have to, I have to know this is available. So uh, I recorded it online and that's how it became an online class. Otherwise it's always been in person. I just love that. Celebrate. And what a model for our girls to slow down. Like, and for us as moms, like, let's slow down and just celebrate you. This is really a a big deal to celebrate your womanhood and who you are and your uniqueness and how you were created and your beauty. And uh, rather than just like, blowing through it, trying to teach them how to use a, a pad or a tampon or, you know, and, yes. and just, because my kids are older now and I look back on that and I think all of those milestones, some which I celebrate, others that I took for granted. And you look back and you will never regret celebrating that brought you closer together and having those conversations that we tend to avoid because we don't know how to have them. And so that's what I love that you're doing is like your, your program is teaching moms how to have that conversation, daughters to be able to talk to their moms about how they're feeling. We really, really need that. Yeah. And as you were saying that, Cheryl, I just thought about how many women, it's, it's maybe not something you talk about, you know, women talk about on a daily basis, but if you do actually talk to women, it could be your sisters, your friends, about their process of not just the period that was definitely, you know, we all usually remember that, but just the process of going from a girl to a woman, there are so many different stories, so many different experiences. This is not universal. The only thing that's universal is that it happens physically to our bodies. We get pubic hair, we get acne, we get body odor, we develop breasts, we develop hips, which girls don't understand why that has to happen to them. Um, you know, and we get our menstrual cycle that happens to us, but the experience of it, the meaning of it is something that, oh, there's probably at least a hundred versions of what that's been like. And I will say it's very rare that anybody tells me this was a beautiful process for me. Yes. My mother talked to me about this and prepared this and we celebrated. That's very unusual. Most of the time it's shame. It was, um, you know, feeling like they were keeping a secret. They were hiding things. If they had a brother or father nearby, they swore that everybody knew and they were trying to hide it and just trying their hardest to acquire information from anywhere they could get. That's your sort of, that's your alternative. If I think if a mom is listening right now, your option is you be the informants and the information um, gatekeeper, as well as the person who they fall into your arms. Um, or you're going to be the opposite of that. Oh, they're going to be avoiding you. You're not going to be the person giving them the information. And nowadays, of course, they're just going to go online and we don't know the information that they're going to get. And we know that there's a lot of messages online that are hurting our girls now with their body image and their self-confidence and all the social media stuff. Absolutely. Like the body confidence is, is huge. And I will say, um, body image and body confidence or lack thereof, but When I tell girls, um, whether it's in the class or just one-on-one, when I tell girls the purpose of their hips widening, I see the light bulb go off in their head. I say, do you know that your hips do that? Because your body will ultimately prepare, if you choose so, to have a baby and make room for it. And they're like, what? (laughs) Like, I had no idea. Yes, let's talk about your breasts. What are the purpose of breasts? You know, and so when you give them a context for, because I will say the breasts are less usually for most girls, but not all less bothersome than the hips, their, their body shape changing their body shape from going like straight up and down to having a curve to it for a lot of girls is very displeasing. And that might be the messages that our society is giving them about what the perfect body looks like, which is extremely thin and doesn't have curves. Well, that's not really a woman's body. So when you can tell them just the biological purpose of it, um, it it shifts for them. Like, okay, well, at least this makes sense. At least I understand why this is. And um, it's really a beautiful thing. Yes. Now tell us, you you mentioned a little bit, but what topics do you cover? So under, um, under social, 
that's where I cover bullying, cyberbullying, social media, screen addiction, friendships, interest changing, liking somebody. And I leave that open now, right? Because there's many girls in middle school that feel like maybe I like a girl, maybe I like a boy, maybe I like both. And I just keep that very neutral, you know, just you feel you like somebody. Here's how that feels. So I go through um, peer pressure and all of those kinds of topics that I see regularly happening socially, even just pressure to put on makeup, to dress differently, wear a crop top, those kinds of things. Um, This is what's to come. Here are some ideas on how to handle it. And the biggest one is really friendships. The person who might have been your best friend throughout all of elementary school all of a sudden says, eh, she doesn't really want to be friends with you. And then, you know, you're in tears. Why does that happen? So I kind of go through both sides, even some empathy building. She's going through a lot of changes right now. You're going through a lot of changes. And you may come back again together a couple of years down the road. But for now, you might still want to be a play on the soccer team you always have. And she wants nothing to do with it. She wants to go join a band. All of that stuff is normal. So I try to normalize it and I try to remind them, I know it still hurts, even though it's normal, but it's normal. So I cover that under social, under emotional is where I teach them about depression, anxiety, um, eating disorders, I touch on. So I don't talk about, um, you know, full blown details of like anorexia or bulimia. I basically talk about you may, or one of your friends may one day look in the mirror and not like what they see anymore. This is when your self-esteem starts to drop. I think that a lot of people don't know that the age of nine is the peak for self-esteem at 10, it starts to drop down in girls. So you really want, you need to talk about body image. It's very difficult, very difficult for most moms. Maybe the most difficult topic, honestly, of all for moms to talk about. Yeah. So loaded for us. It's so loaded for us. So many women have their own body image issues, their own eating disorder history. And then there's eating disorders and then there's disordered eating, right? And somewhere on the continuum, millions of women still struggle with this. So of course they're not, you know, in the best position to talk to their daughters about this tough topic. So I cover mental health and emotional health essentially under emotional. And then the third quadrant or module, as I call it, is the physical. And that's, you know, when I've listed all the pubic hair and breast development and acne and menstruation and shaving and waxing and tweezing and all of those kinds of things. So, and uh, it's very self-paced. So I try to chunk it, put it in little chunks because certainly while you're sitting at home, or if you've got maybe two or three of their friends over and you're watching it, you can only take so much at a time. You want to pause, talk, take a break. Um, but I try to cover everything that I genuinely see every day in my practice with the girls I work with. Well, that's cool too. Do you, have you ever had anybody where they have like three moms and then three daughters that watch it in a group? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so I didn't know what, how this was even going to play out, even if it was going to translate, honestly, because I know what the class is like in person, but I thought there's such a beauty to this class. Gosh, will this transfer over online? But the best feedback I got was from a mom who said, I mean, her, it's beautiful. The note she sent me, like, I need to thank you is basically what she said for, for one of the most beautiful afternoons I've ever had with my daughter. And she said it was me and two other moms we made a brunch, you know, so they did it up. They made a brunch. Um, They had, they made sure that everybody was clear out of the house. They were in the basement. And she said, we watched two out of the three modules together. And we genuinely, we cried, we laughed, we hugged and we celebrated. She said it was just lovely. So I thought to myself, I need to share that with people more because I, I don't know how it translates Um, just you and your daughter sitting on a couch watching it for your own daughter. Maybe that's perfect. Maybe you've got another daughter or another kid and that might be a little uncomfortable. Maybe that's not the way your relationship feels. So if you could get, I like the idea of a group because I think the more people that are hearing the same information in the same groups and the moms are on the same page, the greater your likelihood is that this is going to be a comfortable conversation where everyone's on the same page about the information. Yeah, I love that. And then the girls are sharing it with their friend and they can talk about it. And you've, you've opened it up for them to talk to each other about it and then to the moms. And that's a great idea. I love yeah. that. I do too. I'm really excited. I like that idea a lot. I think that Girl Scout troops could do it together. 
So I think that little, little groups could do it together and it would be really lovely. Yeah. Sharing, sharing the love. Yeah. Well, how have you seen this program help or have you, I mean, I'm sure that you have kind of get ahead of the game when it comes to like drugs, alcohol, um, you know, just making good choices, choices of friends, building confidence, uh, protecting girls from making poor choices. I love that you asked me that because it actually reminds me of the things that I don't cover. And, th- and I'm going to make this important point. So I don't talk about sex. I do not overtly talk about sex. I talk about, um, I do talk about sperm fertilizing an egg. You know, it's like I roll through that, like it's one mm-hmm. slide and I roll through reproduction because I talk about the female reproductive parts, but I don't talk about sex and I don't overtly talk about drugs except for a little bit um, around marijuana. And I did that on purpose because remember this class is maybe nine, but let's say nine, 10, 11, 12 year old girls. Yes. And I think it's the beginning of, I always say, this is just the beginning of, a, of the talk. This is the start. That's why I named it start with the talk. It's like, we're starting a conversation that needs to be lifelong. And I wanted it to be age appropriate enough that people weren't like, oh my gosh, my nine-year-old's not ready to hear about sex or my nine-year-old's not ready to hear about drugs, alcohol, partying. So I try to make it developmentally younger on that side, appropriate enough that you're, you're opening the door for the harder conversations. But I, I implore people, you have to like seventh grade minimum. Now you have to take the baton and start talking about, maybe one day I'll do the older girls version, but then, you know, sex and drugs and those kinds of things. So where I feel the impact most and how it truly has helped them is, is really actually number one, probably with how they, the whole period process, the confidence, the, um, okay, I know what to do. I even remind them, look around, find a sweatshirt or a jacket or something, wrap it around your waist. Just if somebody doesn't tell you that, you might not think to do that. Like, because they always say, I was afraid that when I stood up, you were going to see blood on me. And nobody's even explained to them what that means, blood. You know, I told them it can be brown, it can be maroon, it might be bright red. So the shades of it, the feel, of every detail. So where I see, where I see their choices are A, their confidence within themselves to handle whatever's happening within their body, their confidence to be a leader with their friends who maybe don't have the information. They'll definitely say, so my friend wasn't sure and I told her I knew what to do. (laughs) So they will tell them that. And I would say one of the other big areas that I've seen are sort of the return on investment is I, I go through a section about your family and how you may all of a sudden not want to play with your little brother anymore, or you may not want to play with your little sister anymore and how much they miss you. And I will tell you big return on that one. They'll say, I have really thought about what you said. And so I took the time to still play dolls with my brother or, you know, Legos with my sister, whatever it might be. And the parents have given me that feedback too. Like that made an impact on them that, that everybody's missing them in a way when they start to become too old, too cool, don't want to, you know, do these things. And so I, I feel like those are two really big areas. And then I cyber bullying, I talk a lot about. So I think they feel really, I don't know that it helps necessarily with how much social media they use. I, I talk about it, but the cyberbullying piece, they are pretty, they become very aware that that's actually today the most common form of bullying. It's no longer like the play, the playground, it's online. So I, t- I go through kind of some of the digital citizenship stuff so that's a different class I teach. And so I it put that in there a little bit. And I feel like that's probably a third area that I feel like a lot of girls have had big aha moments. Okay, I'm not going to post this. I'm never going to say this. I understand it's there forever. Those kind of things. Well, I'm laying the foundation where they feel like they can talk to their moms as well. If something like that is happening, yes. then you are helping to build that connection between moms and daughters where the daughter is going to be more likely that she's going to go to her mom and say, this happened, if it does happen. Absolutely. Especially she's more likely to do that if she feels like you can handle it. Right. Like if you're red, the big one, it's like, that's what I'm trying to really, I hope inspire moms is like, if your daughter thinks 
you already know about this. You're prepared for this. You're not going to be reactive. Like you said, you're, you're proactive or you're very calm in your response versus reaction. They're going to go to you. They're more likely to, but if they think, well, my mom doesn't even know this stuff goes on. What would she even know about this? I'm not going to tell her. She might even get mad at me. She'll say that I shouldn't have been in that group text chain. Da, 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 da. When they think that it's going to go south on them, they're going to avoid you. Of course they are. So that's one of the huge advantages too, is to say, I understand what goes on in 2021 or any year that you're listening to this. I understand what goes on in your generation. I understand um, that these are everyday challenges. It doesn't mean you're a bad kid or your group of friends are bad kids. This is just what's happening. And I'm always here to talk to you about it and you won't be in trouble. You know, that's a huge message. Ron, I think that's this program is in my opinion, where I say equally for moms as it is for the daughters, because you're helping moms to become more grounded through this program to know like, okay, this may be what's going to, friendships do change. I don't think I, I mean, I went through that, but I don't think that with my oldest, I really, it didn't register back then, you know, that this could happen. And so Again, you're helping moms to not panic by getting, by talking about all these things. So I appreciate that so that they can be more present for their daughters in whatever it is that they're going through. Absolutely. It's like, it's like an icebreaker, right? Once somebody says, oh, by the way, you know, it's very common that by the age of 11, the kids have already viewed online pornography. By the way, cyberbullying is the most common form of bullying at this point. Your kid might be involved. Here are some tips on how to get them not to be involved. It's like, once I break the ice with parents, they can have that look on their face. Like, really? It's that's common. This is not a rare thing, but it's like, okay. Then all of a sudden you, you kick into a different mode as a parent, right? And you go, all right, I'm informed now. Now, what am I going to do? How am I going to either prevent this? How am I going to start talking about it? Um, and I've met, I know two times now I've mentioned the pornography thing because the first time that I heard those stats, I was mortified. It's like 90% of kids by age 11 have viewed online pornography. That's not everybody knows that. I didn't, I knew that, you know, maybe four or five years ago. And so ever since then, and I don't use the term necessarily pornography. I have a 13, she just turned 13, but I say things like you're, you're going to have questions about sex and boys parts and um, more about your development. I'm happy to look that up with you. I don't have to be the information person for everything, but let's just do that together. I don't want you exploring and wandering off on the internet we can do that together. You don't have to be embarrassed. So I just say that every once in a while. So she knows, I know that this is on your mind. Invite those conversations. Yes. Yes. That's awesome. Tell us uh, about your Facebook group and where they can find all this. And of course, I'm going to put the links in all the podcast information so people can find this. That's great. I, um, I think there's two places you can find information about the class. You can go on my own website, which is Dr. Cheryl Ziegler, Z-I-E-G-L-E-R, drcherylziegler.com and find out um, all sorts of things that I'm up to. And the, there's a class link there. There's also its own startwiththetalk.com. So that's for the class. And then um, as far as the Facebook group, what I'm hoping is to create and build a community around the moms or parents. And we've been talking about a lot about moms, but there's nothing that precludes a a dad from doing this or a grandparent. It just hasn't been my experience that they've done it, but they are welcome to. Um, And when I'm doing the class, I verbally say, I try to say parents almost the whole time. So everybody feels included. And sometimes I'll say, or your caregiver. So I'm thoughtful. I try to be inclusive, Um, but they can, you know, go on this Facebook group when they've, after if they've purchased the class and ask questions as you're going along or before you started. And so it's something that I'm just really developing right now this year. And I'm hoping that it'll grow and it can just be a community of not just informed parents, but like you said, parents who want to know, parents who are curious and are invested in really helping their child transition from really childhood to adolescence, which to me, that are critical three and four years. I love that. You provide that support for the moms and they can come with their questions and, oh my gosh, we celebrated. And this yes. is, where we, this is where I got my pack, you know, for my daughter to celebrate. And 
they have all those different places. I know that you can get the, the, I don't know what they're called, the period pack celebration kits or new moon or whatever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I tell people though, you can just, you know, I get it. I do when I create them, I, it's a pencil pouch. So that reassures the girls. This is no something, there's nothing special about this. This is a pencil pouch from, you know, Amazon or target, wherever you want to buy it. And, you know, just put a pad and a liner and a, a clean pair of underwear and oh, a lollipop. Yeah. I wish that somebody would have told me to do that. Back. Yes. And deodorant. I actually put a little travel deodorant in there too. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> deodorant. You need that too at that age. Oh my gosh. Well, thank you, Cheryl, so much. This has been just great. And, um, and moms check it out. I appreciate everything that you're doing to, how parents, caregivers, to navigate daughters, teens, tweens, to navigate these years and for making, creating this program that I wish that I would have had. It would have really laid that strong foundation. I was reacting a lot and did not even know what to expect. So Yeah, yeah I think it throws people off. Um, yeah. Also, just be, how young it feels like these changes are happening. So... Um, thank you so much for having me and for the encouraging words. I, I really do love this program. It's one of my favorite, favorite things that I do. And I do truly just want as many people as possible to just have access to it. Yeah, it's a gift. So thank you. We'll have you back again when you do your next, <laughs> <laughs> the next thing, that thing that we need desperately. So yes. thank, you. thank you, Cheryl. I'm so happy that you joined me today, and I also have some exciting news to share with you. We have a three-day free live training that is starting on Wednesday, February 3rd at 12 noon to 1 p.m., and it also runs on Thursday the 4th at the same time and the 5th, and the topic is building a strong relationship with your tween and teen the crash course on conflict, communication, and connection. And in this workshop, I'm going to teach you powerful steps that you can take to deal with disrespect, set boundaries that work, and communicate in ways that will build a strong relationship and help your tween and teen to thrive. So just head on over to momsoftweensandteens.com slash free training to get signed up. Well, have a great week. And I look forward to seeing you back here next time.